Simon, I'm very glad that you agreed to talk to me about chronons because I, I was really not sure you had thought about this concept the, you know, when we uh, made programs back in the 90s. Actually, I did. And at the end, the very end of the last show we did on the radio in Israel, in Hebrew, from right to left, so to speak, you mentioned the chronon which was very surprising. So let's re, uh, revisit the chrono. Yeah. And we decided to call this uh, talk, it's high time to define time. Mm. But I would also like to uh, catch another concept, a small concept, the concept of God, which somehow seems to be uh, linked to the question of time. And I'll open with a quotation from Shulamit HaRevan, who was a famous Israeli author, writer. And sh I once asked her what she thought about God. And she said, well, God is the other language. Mm. So, <laughs> here I am. <laughs> she, almost, she almost anticipated my work. Okay. Because my work is about language. Actually. Okay. The so chronon, let's, the chronon let's, field let's is another hear, language. Let's okay. hear about chronons then. First of all, I hate to burst your bubble, but actually our talks were in the 80s. We are much older than that. In the 80s, <laughs> in the 80s you think? 80s. Yeah. Okay. So we're much older but than that. But late 80s, maybe. <laughs> actually, mid 80s. Okay. But uh, late 80s, I think you're right. Yeah. And, um, and so, my work, the Cronon field theory, was first developed in my PhD, mm -hmm. in my PhD in physics, in 1982, 1983. So by the time we had our chats, it was already four years into its existence. Wow. But having tried to communicate it, even to physicists, even once to Richard Feynman, a Nobel Prize winner, you know, and possibly the second brightest mind in physics after Einstein, having tried to communicate the chronon field theory and having failed consistently, I gave up on it. I gave up on it until a group of very, very talented, <laughs> I would say, geniuses, Israeli geniuses, actually, all of them Israeli, picked up a copy of my PhD in the Library of Congress. They didn't know what they were doing. They were searching for time and they found a copy of my PhD okay. in the Library of Congress and they picked it up. And they fell in love with the, with the theory. And ever since then, this group of uh, physicists, uh, all of them are physicists actually, by now well over 50 physicists from seven countries, they've been developing this. Not theory. only Israelis. Not only Israelis anymore. Okay. Okay. Not only Israelis anymore, although the main contributor to this very day is an Israeli, his name is Eitan Sacher, so he's an Israeli. He lives in the United States now. So they, they took the theory further, way further than, I mean, it's no longer you my theory. You don't mean Eitan Sushar, the, 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 the one that is on El Al flights? The one who presents uh, all kinds of mental tricks? Oh, I don't believe so. No, no, no okay. No, so it's no. somebody. He's a computer scientist and a physicist. Okay, okay, no, I don't sorry. believe he would be presenting <laughs> tricks. Because his name he, is also. He didn't go that no, no. No, no. He's a computer scientist and a physicist. He lives in okay. the United States. And others, there's Horowitz, there's others. And they, they work together to develop the theory. And they took it so far that it's no longer mine. It's no longer mine. I was kind of a catalyst or the impetus for the, for the development. Still, most of if not all, of my original ideas are still in the, in the evolved form of the theory. Okay. And so to answer your question, after this very long introduction, which I wanted to put a bit in historical context, what's going on. To answer your question, my, my work, I, what I try to do in my work is twofold. I try to introduce a new language to describe reality, in other words, to do physics. And the second thing I try to do is to deconstruct Einstein and to say that time is not a dimension, but a force. It's a force. The test was this. Can we take these two underlying assumptions? And of course, in this limited time frame, and I can't delve into the equations and so on, but okay. can we take these two principles? Which two principles? New language. A new language with one word, time. Not mass, not momentum, not no, no other words. No vector. Nothing, just time. Time. 
if we take this mono, monosyllabic <laughs> new language and we couple it with a force field, okay. with, with, with the way we describe forces, yes. which we call fields, if we couple these two, can we then derive all the equations in all the fields of physics that has, had ever existed? You were trying to create a tow theory? Uh, yes, a kind of tow theory. Tow theory, yes. in, in a, a theory of everything. Yes, but there's a test for this. And the test is, if you take your assumptions and couple them, and can you, based on these assumptions alone, derive the totality of physics? And what these scientists, uh, these physicists, succeeded to do over the past six years is to derive all of physics. Now I'm now I'm comfortable to say this because mm -hmm. they had completed the work mm -hmm. about uh, two or three months ago. Oh. And they had derived all of physics, cosmology, uh, particle theory, chromodynamics, electrodynamics. As large as cosmology. Everything. And as small let's, as... Let's cut it short. Everything. Everything. Newtonian physics, Einsteinian physics. I mean, you name it, they succeeded from these two principles. So, the question arises, of course. Now that we know that these two principles give us the totality and the entirety of physics, what are these principles? What are we talking about? Right. So, the first thing I, w I wanted... First thing I wanted to do is not to repeat Einstein's mistake. Einstein's mistake was not in developing relativity theories. Relativity theories are not mistaken. Of course. They're very, they're very good theories. They've been proven time and again and so on and so forth. Are we 18 minutes into the talk? No, no, no. We have left. still 18 to 18 minutes left. Uh, but what I consider to be his mistake is that he did not um, invent a new language. Essentially, Einstein's language is Newton's language. They're using the same concepts. Yes, Einstein looked at it from the left side, while Newton was looking at it from the right side. It's like the blind man and the, and the elephant, you know? Yes, yes. yes. Where grasping the elephant. The, one they, of them is they, the, holding they the tail. Touch a different but it's part the same. of the elephant's body. But it's the same elephant. It's the same elephant. It's the same elephant. There's no... Einstein and Newton are working on the same elephant. And I wanted a new elephant. I wanted to introduce a new elephant into the room. Like, like uh, Shulamit Harevan's new language. Yes, exactly. that's what I'm saying. Yes, okay. It's very apt, okay. actually. It's very apt what you said. Mm -hmm. Because I introduced a totally new language. And I said, I am not going to use the old language. I, am, I refuse to speak Hebrew. I'm going to speak English, you know. So I'm not going to introduce, I'm going to introduce, and the new language consisted of one word, time. That's all. That's the, that's the, that's it's a language. language with yeah. one word. I said to myself, I must derive all the equations of physics using one word and one assumption. Now, this is what is known as Occam's razor, parsimony. If there is a multipli multiplication of words and a mu multiplication of entities, probably your theory is wrong. That's Occam's razor. And what had happened in physics over the decades, especially the last hundred years, is an explosion, a supernova of entities, new entities, and supernova of new words and new concepts, which is a very bad sign. It's a sign that we have lost our way. Give me examples of... I don't know. There's well over 100 and something elementary particles. There are models for particles, there are models for gravity. And models no, but that's about particles, not mm. about time. No, no, no. Nobody thought of bringing in uh, particles into the, the theory of time, was there? Everyone, everyone realizes that physics is in crisis because it has too many concepts, too okay, many entities. Okay. Too many laws and rules. So, okay. so everyone is trying to unify okay, that I, greater that theory I okay. to reduce it. Einstein said we should have one equation. Okay. That's one equation, the God equation. Okay. Should have one equation. One equation. And so and I said rather than going from multiplicity to unity, I'm gonna start with unity. Why why do I have to go from multiplicity? I'm gonna start with unity. I'm gonna start with and I said, what should I use? Should I use maybe momentum? Should I use force? Should I use, I don't know, mass? Mass, maybe? Should I use energy? Should I use space? What would capture all of these? And so the only thing that captures all of this is time. Because in time, given time, all these things happen. If I give you, if I, uh, for example, had I decided on energy, energy doesn't give you time. 
energy doesn't give you many elements in physics. Energy gives you mass. Energy can give, en energy is is a form of mass. It's a fa form, form of mass. mass gives you so energy. Energy. Energy gives you momentum and okay. force. Okay. But it doesn't give you many other things. Okay. Okay. So if I take space, space gives me gravity, curvature of space gives me I don't know, mass to some extent, but nothing else. So each of these concepts can give you some other concepts, can lead to some other concepts, but not to others. Okay. There's only one concept that leads to everything. Time. Okay. Given enough time, you have mass, and you have space, and you have force, and you have momentum, and you have everything else. Given enough time. Everything happens in time, in due time. So I said, okay, so let me rewrite physics using, using time. But then I said, if I use time as a field of potentials, because it's a field of potentials where everything can happen, mass can happen, force can happen, momentum can happen. So it's a field. It's, it's a, a field, field of potentials. Of potential. Potentialities. Yes. But we know in physics that whenever we have a field, we have a force. There's no such thing in physics as field without force. You have electromagnetic field. So whenever you have a field, you have a force. So I said, this should not be an exception. If time is a field of potentials, then it's a force. Because we don't have an exception. Okay. Okay, so it's a force. So time is a force. Time is a force, not a dimension. And then I went further. I said, wait a minute. If time is a force, we know that all forces are mediated via particles. And or waves? Particles are described potentially as waves. Okay. But forces are mediated through particles. Particle. Even mass is mediated through a particle known as Higgs boson. So particles mediate the physical world. They, they, they are like couriers. They are like Federal Express. They have their small vans and they carry energy. Yes. They carry mass. They carry, you know. Right. They are like couriers. So I said time should not be an exception. If time is a field and time is a force, there should be a particle of time to mediate time. And then I came to chronons. And chronons are the, these particles. But then I went a step further. I don't know if you're following me. I'm, I'm following you. So, so far I know it, I'm trying to make it that as we've reached the, the you know. I'm trying to make it as, as simple as the possible. The particle called chronon. Yes. And now I'm yeah. trying to understand what it does. But I'm showing you the, I'm showing you the, heri the, the heritage, the chain of, the chain of, uh, of, of thought. thought. Yeah. The train of thought. So, and then I said, okay, there's, there's this particle. But time is a field of potentialities. So there must be a way for time to become mass. There must be a way for time to become momentum. There must be a way for time to become force, energy. There must be a way to realize these potentials okay. in the field. Yes. How? So I said, well, the only solution is for the chronon to be in different states. Not in a single state, but to change states. We call this process excitation. So the chronon is excited. <laughs> yeah, right. A little like me. Yeah, yeah, the right. chronon is excited. And when it passes through various excitations, and it disrupts the field. It disrupts the field. And it creates events. Disruption of the field is an event. This event could be, if we look at it, at the, an event this way, it's mass. If we look at it the other way, it's energy. Depends on how you look at these events, they translate into the totality of physics. So, chronons are change. You can think of it this way if you want, okay. in layman's terms. Chronons shape shift, they change shape. Okay. When chronons so they disguise themselves, they wear clothes. Okay. If they wear a certain type of clothing, they become mass. If they wear another type of clothing, they become energy. Another type, they become force. So the excitation states disrupt the field, literally disrupt it, and create what we call reality. Are there, uh, is there a specific number of excitation stages? This is a, a question that is excellent. Almost I could begin to suspect that you're a physicist. <laughs> Because there is a, a Pauli principle that says that excitation states are, are quantum. In other words, they, they are not continuous, but they exactly, are, they are yes. disparate. Exactly, yes. Okay. So, yes, the chronon excitation states 
are disparate. They obey the Pauli exclusion principle. Okay, so... Disparate. But we can map each excitation state to the old language of physics. Like, this excitation state is what used to be called in physics mass. Mass, okay. And so on. So we have a dictionary. We have like a dictionary. Okay, so this excitation stage is mass and this excitation state stage is... State is, is state energy. Is, is energy. This excitation state is, is force. If I may, there's another example. Uh, I learned uh, many years ago that uh, actually the Indian belief is a monotheistic belief. So I said, but you have Brahma, Shiva and Vishnu. And they said, well, they are only manifestations of the one Godhead. Holy Trinity. You don't need to go so far. You could, Holy even, Trinity. You could even say that. Holy yes, Trinity. Yes. It's one God, it's but one God with three manifestations. Yeah. So here we have exactly one. It's one, one field of potential field, which is where there is a single particle. Particle. And this single particle changes its Wears shape. Wears different guises. Guises. And becomes what we used to call the old physics. Even Einsteinian physics becomes. So, how does it become excited? How, how did, why, why would it become excited? Why and by, by, by what and by whom? Yeah. How, how would it... Um, it acquires... It, it accelerates. It, it moves. Mm -hmm. the, the field of potential is a field of potential because it, it has um, kind of latent energy in it. So, the, the particle... Think of it... The particle surfs the wave. Think of this field as an ocean. So, the particle is surfing the waves. Okay. And he's accelerating. As it accelerates, it creates these, all these things, mass and, and so on. So this is in a, in a nutshell. But here's the beauty. The beauty is that by using essentially two principles, time as a force with a field and a single particle in different excitation states, which is infinitely simpler than current physics. Like infinitely simple. I mean, current physics is, is an abomination. It's, this is much simpler. If you use this, you can derive every theory ever invented in physics, including string theory, including uh, quantum field theory, the latest, the cutting edge theories in physics. If you use these two simple principles, you can derive them fully. You get them fully. So I give an example to just to to let's say thousand. Um, I said that the chronon has excitation states, yes? When the chronon is, gets excited, like me, it vibrates. It begins to vibrate normally. Yes. It accelerates, and of course, creates vibrations. These vibrations are what, what we call strings in string theory. Okay. Because strings in th string theory are tiny vibrations, tiny, tiny vibrations that look like strings. So they're tiny vibrations. So, when the chronon vibrates, gets excited, accelerates, never mind how you call it, it becomes a string, in effect. In other words, the two theories intermesh perfectly, seamlessly. And my theory yields all the equations of string theory, without any effort. I have another question, and this will prove that I'm not a physicist. Has anybody ever seen a chronon? No, you don't need to see, no, no one has seen a quark. Okay, nobody has seen a nobody quark. Seen a quark. Um, we don't pretend in uh, physics, at least <laughs> good physicists, don't pretend that they are talking about reality. Physics deals with one subject matter, physics. That's the subject matter of physics. So that's a language? It's a language that, that deals with language. That deals with language. And then there is a corresponding correspondence theory of truth. This language should somehow resonate with our observations. Okay. And we have processes, the scientific method, falsifiability. We have ways to test how close is the language to our observations. But we don't pretend to, to put our finger on quark, on a quark. A quark is a useful language element. It's a useful language, a useful metaphor. Okay. Why it's useful? Because it yields predictions that we can then falsify via observations. End of story. Same with my theory. It's not a question whether there is a chronon. A chronon is a language element. And if the chronon theory yields all the other theory in physics which are already tested, these theories are verified. Yes. For example, 
you can derive relativity theory totally from coronal theory. Okay. No problem whatsoever. That was actually one of the easiest tasks. But deriving string theory and quantum field theory was much more difficult. But with, with, it's, it's also... All the theories of physics can be derived from this, and because they are verified, chronon field theory is verified, actually. So, it's like I would, uh, it's like Esperanto, or oh, I would come with some language, and this language would have one word and one... one well, Esperanto has many words. <laughs> one word, and one grammatic principle. Imagine, I come with one word and one grammatic principle. So you can't express the... Reality. Right, exactly. This, yeah, I mean, this language is useless. And then I show you that through clever manipulation, you can actually derive not only Hebrew, but uh, all the languages okay, of the world. Okay, okay, okay. And not only all the existing languages of the world, but every possible The language. artificial languages. Every possible language, including artificial, yes, including what we call formal, formal languages. This is chronophilia. That's the power of chronophilia. Thank you.